two shirt. Aw, that's cute. Bloop boop boop. Bloop doop doop. Bloop doop da ba Getting jangly, y'all. <laughs> Hear those guitars jingle jangle. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Michael. Oh, I'm Molly. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on a little walk down memory lane while we review some albums from 1992. I already have one video of reviewing a few albums from 92, but these are a few more that we probably would have spent way too long talking about in our full music from 92. We're fully gonna spend way too, too long talking about them now. Yeah, yeah, but it's okay now because we don't have a million other albums to talk about as well. So R.E.M.'s album, Automatic for the People, is their best-selling album of is all it time. Really? It is. It is. More than Out of Time. Yes. I sort of find a theme in this album, and the theme that I envision it is youth and inexperience mm. compared against wisdom that comes from age. Yeah. Everybody Hurts is probably R.E.M.'s best-known song, but I don't think it's their best. You think it's their best-known song yeah, over I... um, Losing My Religion? Ooh, yeah, they might be losing my religion. Also not their best song. <laughs> I can get a little tired of Everybody Hurts, but it's a good song. In your notes, you talk about how- It builds, it builds yeah. yeah. And it's, it's really effective. It's kind of emotionally manipulative, but I don't mind it in this case. It feels emotionally manipulative in a very deliberate, almost winking at you way, yeah, right? Yeah. To be like, we're gonna write this cheesy song. And it's, it's meaningful, right? It doesn't take away the, the actual meaning of the song, but it's also like, Okay, like, let's all have a good cry together. Probably the second best known song on this album is Man on the Moon, and that is probably my favorite R.E.M. song. It's a great I song. I really love that song. I think also very good on this album, The Sidewinder Sleeps Tonight. It just sounds like they're having so much fun in this song. Love that song. Um, and Michael sounds really good on those high notes. Whenever he sings in that register, I always think that that's one of the, sta those are the standout yeah. R.E.M. tracks. Yeah. And I love the spot in the middle of the song when he starts laughing while he's singing in the recording. It's also, so, it's so endearing. Yeah, and it's you know it's one of the more jangly songs on this album. <laughs> yeah. To me, R.E.M. invented that sound, kind of. I mean, probably not, but like, but I think we're gonna talk about it a little bit on here, and then probably when we do 1993 albums, is that the rise of this sound and how popular it was with this band with an album we're about to talk about, which is the Gin Blossoms, New Miserable Experience. And then when we get into 93, you have Hootie and the Blowfish, their album comes out and like, they're probably in the studio recording it right now. And the Counting Crows, August and everything after. It was like a fire sale on tambourines happening. <laughs> it was like, everybody went to Guitar Center and they got all the tambourines they could. <laughs> and they were like, let's make an album. I also really love Sweetness Follows. I think there's so much hope in that song. And mm -hmm. it's really funny because it starts off about burying your mother and your father. And it's, I don't know how Michael did this. It's a neat songwriting trick to turn it into like this really hopeful thing by the end. I think it's a really yeah. beautiful song. I don't know if Michael Stipe actually wrote this song because all of the tracks on this album are credited to all the mm -hmm. members of the band. But assuming it was Michael Stipe, it feels like Michael Stipe is like the kind of guy who like embodies the kind of friend that like I strive to be yeah. <laughs> to my friends. Like the, the lyrics of this song, you just feel the kind of connection and presence and empathy and here for you. Mm -hmm. Like a bridge <laughs> over. Also, a song with a lot of hope is the last track, Find the River, which I also think is really beautiful. And it has one of the best melodies on the album. Mm. It also has some of the best lyrics on the album. There's some metric fuckery that happens. The fourth hyperbeat of the chorus is also the hyper downbeat of the transition back to the verses. It's really cool how it works. Like, you almost don't notice it. But it's like, that was four and one at the same time. There's a track on this album that everyone loves, but I think, honestly, is a little overrated, and that's Night Swimming. And I know a lot of people are going to be mad at me for saying that. I'm a little mad at you for saying that. <laughs> I think the lyrics and the storytelling in the song are so beautiful. I like the strings in the oboe. Like, often in pop and rock songs, when there are more classical orchestral musicians added, I can find it kind of cheesy, but I think it's really artfully done in this song. It's just the piano. There are no sections to this song. It's just yeah, the A the section repeated and forever. Again. And it's just like, any change. The piano grates on me. It does what a lot of, I think, the worst R.E.M. songs do, which is this ad nauseum rep repetition where it doesn't really go anywhere. But I think for this song, it works mm -hmm. in a different way. And part of it is because it's like this mood setting. It almost fills the place of night 
cricket sounds or something mm-hmm. that are just sort of like there in the background and then you have this sort of stream of consciousness lyrics that come out and to me this is a song that I think people who are hardcore REM fans will often list as like their favorite REM song to me this song is so core to like what R.E.M. is. Part of it is the southernness, like the Georgia-ness mm-hmm. of it. This song feels very Georgia. I don't think it's a bad song. I just don't think it's as good as most people think it is. Really, there's only one song on this album that I think is really not that great, and that's the instrumental. It's very improvisatory, and I don't think it's effective. It's not unlistenable. It's just like, uh, I forgot that I normally skip this song, but I'm cleaning the house and I don't care that much. I find all the R.E.M. instrumentals to be very skippable, <laughs> yeah. actually. Yeah. It's one of those albums that to me, it seemed like everybody had it in their five cassette changer or CD changer. It was in everybody's car. Everybody knew all the words to every song. There are albums that I think of in this category. It's like this one, The Counting Crows, August and Everything After, Alanis Morissette, Jagged Little Pill. These are like albums that just were very definitive of my childhood in a way that you don't have now where, where culture is so siloed. Right, because basically everybody can get whatever they want piecemeal. You learned about new music by hearing it on the radio or on MTV, and then you bought the album because you couldn't listen to just one favorite track on Spotify, right? You had to go buy the whole album. And so this is one of those albums. It is the Gin Blossoms' New Miserable Experience. And the story of this album is kind of tragic. I think it's pretty well known. Um, If you don't know it, I'll sort of give some background. So the Gin Blossoms are a band from Tempe, Arizona. One of the great sort of desert bands, Mm. along with like the Eagles. The Killers. The Killers. (laughs) They were um, just like any band. They were playing bars, playing small venues news trying to get a record deal and they did in the midst of recording this album their lead guitarist and song writer Doug Hopkins who was suffering from alcoholism really spiraled you hear reports from the band members that he couldn't even stand up during recording sessions that like he couldn't play he was a mess Uh, you know there are some people who say that like he didn't really want to go on a major label he it felt like selling out to him he was conflicted about it and you know he really struggled with with this time and so at the end of the recording session when the album was complete the band and the label fired him what follows is that this band releases the single hey jealousy which is i think widely regarded to be the best song by the gin blossoms one of the best songs of 1992 honestly yeah it's an incredibly dark song written by doug hopkins about drunkenly trying to win back a girl who has let you go. You have nothing to offer. What is that lyric that is so dark? He says, um, if you don't expect too much from me, you might not be let down. Yeah. Like how mm. heavy is that, mm. <laughs> right? To basically say, I have nothing to offer you, but please mm. give me a chance. This song, you know, is a number one hit basically. So Doug Hopkins has been fired from the band and he's watching this meteoric rise. He has signed away all his rights to the songs that he wrote and suffers immensely from it because he's already struggling with addiction and mental health problems. And he went out and bought a gun and shot himself with it and died. And the band, their follow-up album after this was called Congratulations, I'm Sorry, as a reference to their enormous success and the loss of their former bandmate. The dark thing about this to me is that it was Doug Hopkins' songwriting that really made the band. I mean, there are a few good songs on the band that were written by other members, but really the standout tracks are the Doug Hopkins songs. It's clear to me that the right decision was for the band to to let him go because he was holding them back. So you sort of see both sides of it of like, oh, how painful it must have been to watch people experience enormous success off of the work that you did and you don't get a piece of that pie. And also for the band to be sort of on the other side of that. It's heavy stuff. Yeah. But let's talk about the music. So a lot of the music is quite dark. And this is one of those 
albums that is famous for being like songs that sound happy but are actually really depressing. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the first track on this album is Lost Horizons. You know, in my notes, I commented that the lyric is so dark for a platinum album. <laughs> yeah. Opening track where it says, I drink enough of anything to make the world look new again. And I'm just trying to imagine what like my seven year old self in the back seat of my parents like station wagon sounded like singing along to this <laughs> song. I'm drunk, drunk, drunk in the gardens and the grave. I also wonder what it's like for Robin Wilson to sing these songs. As you get older, you start to see things in a different way. And I think I hear this song from the point of view of the woman that it's addressing, who is like... What do I have to do to get you out of my house? Do I have to fucking call the cops? Right. Don't make me call the cops. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that is the appropriate response to this like dirt bag who shows up mm -hmm. and is like, just let me crash on your couch. I'm not gonna try anything. Did you know that the lyric, you can trust me not to think and not to sleep around, but the actual lyric that Doug wrote was, you can trust me not to drink. Oh. And the singer, Robin Wilson, was so sick of the references to alcohol in all of these songs. He's like, I'm gonna change this lyric. Something that's interesting to do is to go back and it's not on Spotify. You have to um, look up bootlegs of it. They are pre sort of major label recordings of some of these songs on their 1989 album, Dusted. They play Hey Jealousy. It is so fast. Like it's kind of a fast, upbeat song anyway. It is so fast. It's much more raw. It goes much harder. It's less jangly. Robin singing is much- <laughs> Is harsher. Yeah. When you look at the album credits for this song, you have various songs on the album written by different members of the band. About half of them are written by Doug Hopkins and about another half of them, give or take, are written by Jesse Valenzuela, who was um, a guitarist in the band. You can very much hear the difference between a Hopkins song and a Valenzuela song. The Hopkins songs are the ones that have the really dark lyrics. The Valenzuela songs, they're trying to get that same sound, but they don't have that edge to them. Mm. And they're all sort of about chasing women. I think what else is interesting is that there's two tracks on this album that stand out for being in a different style. One is called Cajun Song. It's literally a Zydeco track. It even has on accordion, the son of Clifton Chenier, who was known as the king of the Zydeco, is playing accordion on this track to give it some extra authenticity, right? If you ever doubted the authenticity. <laughs> and another track that is basically a Western swing song at the end of the album, the last track on the album cheating. cheating i think what's interesting about these songs and i rated them more highly than you did is the band feels very much at home in these styles yeah and i get the sense that this is what jesse valenzuela actually wants to do mm -hmm. right is this kind of more uh rootsy folk revival kind of music until i fall away got got some radio play i think yeah yeah, yeah. I, it was sort of the slow um, song right yeah. and that's a valenzuela song oh but we didn't we haven't talked about found out about you yet oh that song is so good and that's another fast one too. and it's creepy Oh, it's super creepy. Yeah. yeah. It's a really well-constructed radio song. Yeah. You hear anecdotes from the band members or Robin Wilson saying that he knew instantly that this was a hit, like in the studio when they were recording it. It is just a textbook. If you were giving a songwriting class, a pop songwriting class, like you could use this song as an example. Actually, Robin sounds really great singing so, on that song. I think the secret sauce of Gin Blossoms on this album is Robin Wilson's vocals and Doug Hopkins lyrics. Yeah, Alison Rose is a fun song. I love that song. It's a Valenzuela song, isn't it? Oh no, Wilson. Wilson and Valenzuela's voices are sort of like Michael Stipe and Mike Mills' oh, voices. Totally. They're very similar, yeah. but one's just a little bit better. Yeah, and when you have Valenzuela on the backup vocals, it just blends yeah. so well together. Yeah. It just makes me want to get a tambourine <laughs> and just... <laughs> <laughs> Nirvana's incesticide. And I want to start by saying it is incesticide and not insecticide because I kept on messing it up when I was writing it down all over the place. It's sort of a weird album name. I don't know if the concept of the songs in the album fit that name, but I, what I will say is that it's a really SEO optimized <laughs> album title. The band called it Cash Cow because it was basically like these pre-recorded tracks. The, the record label didn't have to do anything. Yeah, this is a B-sides and rarities and covers album basically. So there are a handful of covers. There are two tracks that are different takes of songs on previous albums. And a lot of the rest of them are just sort of like, hey, we threw this together with differing results. I actually think the covers are the best 
parts of the album. Yeah, um, I didn't know they were covers. Yeah. Of these four albums that we are covering today, the best song is I Will Always Love You. Mm. I think Molly's Lips is number two. I think it's so fun. I wouldn't put Molly's Lips higher than Hey Jealousy. Hey Jealousy. Yeah. <laughs> I would. And you know I love Molly's Lips. <laughs> I'm contractually acqui- required to love Molly's Lips, but... It is a freaking great song. Yeah, it's so much fun. When I was in college, I had never heard that song before. And a friend of mine played it for me. She's like, the song always makes me think of you. (laughs) And I think part of it was because Molly, right? But like also because like that lyric, she'll take me anywhere as long as I stay clean. Because I was a little buttoned up back in Uh those days. I hadn't completely shaken off my like evangelical (laughs) sort of upbringing. And um, yeah, I will take you anywhere as long as you (laughs) stay clean. Should have met Hopkins. You can trust me not to drink. (laughs) (laughs) One thing that I think is really interesting about this album is that it's not Dave Grohl on the drums on every song. I said this about Bleach, Mm. because Bleach had two different drummers on it, and it really changes the sound of the band, Mm. and it's also really noticeable here. Dave Grohl always talks about how his drumming style was highly influenced by Motown drummers, Mm. and you can really hear that in a lot of these songs with snare on one, two, three, and four, which is a very Motown thing. And I think it's really fun to hear what from pop music has come into Nirvana Mm. in a lot of their songs. It doesn't show up quite as much on this album as it does on Nevermind. Nevermind is a much more poppy Mm. album, as we talked about in our discussion of what is pop and what is rock. Right. This album doesn't have even close to the mass appeal that Nevermind had. And that's kind of by design, right? Because Nevermind was already a smash success, right? Nirvana is already top of the charts and so now and that's part of why they called this cash cow it's like anybody will buy an album with the name nirvana on it so let's just release a bunch of tracks that we already had that they already had recorded and put it on an album a lot of these songs they're much grittier and harsher i mean there's some songs that just feel like full-on noise tracks right that would never ever get the radio airplay or mt or even mtv airplay that the songs from Nevermind or even In Utero. Right. Right. Had. Yeah, like Sliver is a song about childhood and whenever Nirvana writes a song, whenever Kurt Cobain wrote a song about childhood, I always sort of like prickle a little bit because there's some really deep, dark stuff in a lot of Nirvana's songs about childhood. But this one's really not. It's a, it, This one's okay. <laughs> Grandma, take me home. Grandma, Grandma take me home. home. <laughs> I think Sliver might be the best original Nirvana song on the album, maybe. Mm. Either this or aneurysm. Aneurysm. They're both really good. And and Kurt's performance is really good on Sliver. But then we get to like other Nirvana originals, Stain and Been a Sun. They're both really repetitive, but I don't mind actually for these two songs. I like how lyrically progressive Been a Sun is mm. in the way that we know that Kurt always was. Like Kurt was very much a feminist mm. and a lot of his songs are about that. And Been a Sun is like, I love the lyrics of Been a Sun. I think they're cutting. Look at this mirror, everyone. I think here I want to introduce my thoughts about this album and grunge and Nirvana as a representative of grunge because what's interesting about this album because it's sort of a compilation is you have songs that feel very much like Nirvana in their sort of larval stage. Like they're still trying to figure out what they're going to become. And then you have tracks that feel like Nirvana songs. I think Sliver is a really good example of that. It feels very much like a Nirvana song. Some of the songs on this album feel like punk songs, right? And we know that Nirvana had a strong punk influence. Some of the songs on this album feel like metal songs. In the lineage of Black Sabbath, (laughs) I think that what you see in the fully formed Nirvana songs is a marriage of that metal and punk Mm -hmm. coming together. And what you get is that grunge sound with the distorted guitars with the Kurt Cobain gravelly voice but also I think the ones that are more punk songs also feel like they're poppier and there's that Mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier how there's such a close connection to punk and pop actually they sort of come from a different ethos but the structure of the songs in those two styles are often very similar yeah and I actually think that like the big thing that separates some of the earlier grittier grunge from punk is that punk to me has a very specific aesthetic sensibility and there's also a political Mm -hmm. alignment that is you know like the whole anarchy anti-capitalism sort of thing this album famously had a a track like a liner note that basically said nazi punks fuck off kind of like they weren't not a part of that right? right but at the same time i don't think kurt cobain would have been caught dead in a mohawk Right. Right. (laughs) Right. I think what it is, 
is that punk is counterculture, but in a look at me way a little bit more. And grunge is counterculture and a don't look at me. <laughs> ah, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that completely holds up. Let well, me know yeah, what your because thoughts like, below. I said punk has an aesthetic sensibility. Grunge obviously also has an aesthetic sensibility, but it's an anti-aesthetic. Whereas punk, it's like, I'm going to deliberately take this leather jacket and I'm going to put studs on it and I'm going to put patches on it and I'm going to spend an hour shellacking my hair so it stands up a certain way. Yeah. A grunge person does not have the time for all of that, right? They are going to throw out on <laughs> whatever they were wearing. Yeah. It hasn't been washed. Right. Neither has their hair. I can't remember who it was that pointed out that like the grunge look was just what people wore in the Pacific Northwest because it was cold yeah. and they were all working blue collar jobs. Yeah, it's so, what you could get at Kmart or whatever. <laughs> it was workwear, yeah. you know, flannel shirts and yeah. and blue jeans. Yeah. Yeah, with holes in them. Right. Because you had been wearing them for decades and they wore holes in them. Mm -hmm. What you were saying about metal influences on Nirvana, I think is really apparent in Aero Zeppelin, which is a song mm -hmm. that's an intentional parody of, yeah. of like more masturbatory rock. And they're intentionally trying to like make fun of Aero Aerosmith mm -hmm. and Led Zeppelin, but they actually also liked Aerosmith. They say in interviews, we're making fun of this, but we also like it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I don't hear Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith in that song. Maybe Led Zeppelin more than Aerosmith, because I feel like Led Zeppelin was a little more psych um, psychedelic. Mm -hmm. Again, I keep hearing Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that this was a parody. I see that now. Yeah. And... You know, because it does feel like it's not the kind of music that Nirvana does. It's too frou-frou. Yeah. And by frou-frou, I mean it's too complex. It has a guitar solo, and Kurt normally doesn't like guitar solos, and the producers often had to talk him into guitar solos. I and, could see how that yeah. conversation would go. Yeah. Uh, and so he's, he, he usually just, like, <laughs> intentionally, clumsily played the yes. melody. But this has a more established, worked-out guitar solo in it. Interestingly, though, I think the song that sounds the most like it could be an Aerosmith song is the next one, Big Long Now. Mm. That almost sounds like it could be an Aerosmith song to me. In Big Long Now, it also has that metal feel to me, and it sounds to me more like some of the grunge bands from this era who were more metal influenced, particularly Soundgarden. The songs that I think don't come out as well in this album are the ones that are more improvisatory. The song Mexican Seafood is really just a demo. It's just them like thrashing and Kurt making up lyrics. It sounds like a punk song. I also really don't like New Wave Polly. It doesn't really make the original any better. The song was intentionally re-recorded because of some violence that was inspired by Polly on uh, Nevermind. And Kurt was appalled at this and wanted to make a statement about it, but I don't know if this statement works. Come on over, do the twist is such an iconic iconic opening line for a Nirvana song. It's so great. This also feels like like the darkest song on this album. Yeah. Beat Me Out of Me. Also <sighs> such a good line, but God, damn. So... <laughs> sort of like what we were talking about with the Doug Hopkins songs. I think Aneurysm is one of the most iconic Nirvana songs. Here's the thing about it, right? People talk about how like troubled souls make good art. And there's something to that. And it's not that being troubled makes good art. I think good art comes from bearing your soul. And so if a troubled person feels compelled to bear their soul in their art, it makes that art so much more compelling. Right. If you talk to most artists, they would create better art if they were safe and well taken care of and had enough money and resources and everything like that. So we're not saying don't pay musicians and other artists, please do. I feel very strongly about this. I think it's very problematic to say, you know, such a shame that Kurt Cobain was so troubled, but like that's how we got such good, you know, music out of him. It, to me, it's more that if he was happy and he was bearing his soul in the same way, you would have had the same quality yeah. output. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now for something completely <laughs> different. <laughs> We're gonna move to our last album and bring in a guest. We are now joined by Ramin to talk about some Whitney Houston. Were you uh, able to come up with any thoughts to like start the conversation or do you want to just chime in? I have nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing, except that this has some of Whitney Houston's greatest belting of her career on it. Most anthemic songs, really. Although it is interesting, like the number of songs that aren't so anthemic that are on the recording but aren't so renowned anymore. like. Like the more intimate moments in the movie, if you've seen it. So yeah, this movie's soundtrack is in many ways what made the movie as good as it was. As I referenced in the movie review video we did earlier, this movie was not bad, but the music 
is what made it really good. And I mean, if you look at the track list on here and you just hear in your mind's ear when Houston's singing it, you recall that her belt on this album throughout is just so consistent and she's so excellent at like her mid to upper range of like mixing the belts to sound softer at times and uh, more vulnerable and yet still resonant. It sounds stupid to say like, Whitney Houston sounds great on this album. <laughs> we think of the 80s Whitney Houston where she's singing these really sort of girlish songs like I want to dance with somebody and how will I know mm -hmm. if he really loves me? And I feel like she is a woman now. She's had experiences. Her voice is richer, somehow richer and darker. When she sings I Will Always Love You, which is the track that people identify with this album and probably the track that people identify with Whitney Houston. I don't think it's going too far to say that that is the technically best pop vocal performance ever. I think that's a defendable statement, yeah. Even though a lot of the best parts of this album are front-loaded, when it's good, it's really good. I mean, I Will Always Love You to Molly's point about good singing I know we're waxing a lot about Winnie's voice. Winnie's voice is the reason why you buy a wig. Yeah. yeah, it's not just her voice. It's ha it's her skill of using that voice. Like, right. that is a teachable Right, and like, thing. to your point, the number of skills that when you really listen to I Will Always Love You are required of that female pop vocalist's voice. I mean, you have breath control. You have dynamic contrast. You have extremes of range. Those phrases are crazy long in that song. And, yeah. and that, that unprepared modulation, <laughs> right? That is like yeah. the unprepared, it's, it's the unprepared modulation yeah. of all time. Yeah. Right, uh, or like the way that she shifts register on those, yeah. love you. I mean, I'm doing oh, it like yeah. down multiple octaves. <laughs> in the final refrain. That, yeah. It has that register shift, but it's so smooth. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Right. And so you hear the, the contrast in vocal colors, but it also just feels like one instrument. I don't know if I believe it's true, but apparently Kevin Costner suggested that Whitney sing this song and suggested that you do the first verse acapella. I don't know if I believe that. I think that's preposterous. When yeah. You have Babyface and Clive Davis producing yeah. this album and like the idea that they're not the ones suggesting that right. it's so preposterous to me. Right, right. Like, who are you, Kevin Costner? Go dance with Bob. <laughs> the other story I have about I Will Always Love You is how this song almost killed me. Um, <laughs> you know I have to tell the story, and I have to be dramatic about it because it's funny. In 2012, a group of friends and I were going out drinking. Ramin was driving, because Ramin it was, it was our DD for the night. So Ramin picked up me and another friend, and it was rainy. But that also was the day that Whitney Houston died that we were going out. And as Ramin is driving, <laughs> I Will Always Love You comes on the radio. And Ramin starts crying. <laughs> it probably wasn't actually that close, but in the moment, it felt like you were about to hit something or somebody. That's one of my favorite stories about how this song almost killed me. <laughs> to the point that I see in the notes from Michael that reminds me of my feeling as well, it's still important to bear in mind that even though we've been, I've mostly been calling this a Whitney album, it's not really a Whitney album in the same way that like the Dick Tracy soundtrack is not really a Madonna soundtrack. You know, right. movies that famously star famous pop singers, famously including famous songs on them, do not a pop singer's album make. Yeah, I um, will interject to say that I listened to this album for the first time all the way through today. <laughs> and that was, I am today years old when I discovered that there are songs that are not performed by Whitney Houston on this <laughs> album. Yeah, no, like, there shouldn't the be. G Aaron Neville song came on and I was like, oh, it's a duet with Aaron Neville. Oh wait, Whitney doesn't sing on this. <laughs> we talk about I'm Every Woman. But it stands out to me as the track that has like a dance beat. It has that house beat. I will say, it is a testament to this cover that I like it as much as the Shaka cover, the Shaka version, excuse me. Yeah. Because I love, I mean, Shaka Khan's one of my top five pop Shaka singers Khan. of all time. <laughs> I also love how Whitney shouts Shaka Khan. <laughs> Shaka Khan. <laughs> yeah. Apparently Shaka was a little mad that Whitney covered that song. She's quoted from an interview in 1993 with Vibe magazine. She said, why can't anybody find their own material? I did. 
And it's also a testament to the cover's credit that, in my opinion, while it's definitely clearly still the same song, there's enough that's different about it that I don't mind listening to both back-to-back, for instance. The like, I, version is a disco song, and the Whitney Heath version is a house. Right. Yeah. A lot of the basics are still very much the same, but like the color of the percussion that they use and all that, you know, the, like yeah. you to your point, the differences between house and disco are significant. Right, house wouldn't exist if disco didn't exist first anyway. And it's a testament to the song's credit that so many people think it was originally a Whitney Houston song. And by so many people, I mean like even people who, for example, are old enough to know both. Even when she says Shaka Khan. To me... I have nothing and run to you, scratch the yeah. same itch. I listen to them when I'm in the same kind of mood. I probably like I have nothing a little more, like if you, you know, demanded that I make a call. Run to you is a little more mom rock now that I'm kind of remembering the full song in its entirety. Yeah. But the thing about a voice like Whitney Houston's is it sells mom rock in a way that many other singers at the time attempted to sell and did not succeed so handily. Yeah, Run to You could be a Celine Dion song. I have nothing especially, but also I will always love you. Somehow, something about them musically has this, I don't know how to describe it, this like narrative quality to it that the show tune does. Yeah. I have nothing, you know, it really does have peaks and valleys. It builds to that chorus. You could imagine her on a Broadway stage with an audience in the palm of her hands having that showstopper moment. And I think the key change in I Have Nothing is one of my favorite key changes in oh, all pop music. Oh, so good. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really good. Also, uh, I think it's very funny how there are backup singers on that track, but they only sing, don't you dare, and that's it. <laughs> the only other tracks that stand out to me are the Whitney ones, but I will say, I like Queen of the Night in a like splashy drag lip sync kind of way. It's not really something I'm going to go looking up on YouTube, but when they inevitably pick it on RuPaul's Drag Race, it will probably be one of my favorites from the show. I know, Ramin, that you said that you don't mind Jesus Loves Me, but I'm sorry, not even Whitney can make that song work for me. <laughs> what I thought was interesting about that track is that like, to my point earlier about how mature she sounds on this album, she lightens it up into this girlish tone again on that track. And she's going more specifically gospel on that track. Right, right, right obviously. But it's right. like, she's clearly trying to sound more innocent, right? Whereas the rest of the song feels more like, uh, okay, mature, experienced, worldly. I like it for the same reasons Molly just listed. When I have heard and sung Jesus Loves Me before, it doesn't set me on fire. It's more just about being a Whitney stand and seeing like, oh, she could do that trick too. Like that's in her hat as well. Mm -hmm. Um, that was her original trick. Yeah. That's where she got her chops in many ways. But yeah, the rest of the album, I mean, th thank you for the that one instrumental track. I didn't remember it then and I don't remember it now. I think I'm sort of in the minority here, but I don't really like listening to soundtracks for any other media outside of that media. Like, I don't really like listening to game soundtracks unless I'm playing the game. I don't like listening to movie soundtracks unless I'm watching the movie. I don't think you're in the minority in that. I think that those kinds of soundtracks don't do a lot of business. And I think that the people who are into them are big nerds or people who like the idea of listening to classical music, but don't actually like classical music. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like listening to really any kind of instrumental music that has narrative qualities to it, just because I have a hamster brain that like likes to imagine up, dream up like what might be happening, like just create stories while I'm listening. But that is not most people. I'm just a little weird. Even for someone like me. No, I don't go to see Bodyguard for the story. Like I go to see the Whitney Houston drag show. I go to see Dream Girls starring Whitney Houston, but it's a Dream Girls <laughs> starring Whitney Houston. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what if she was in Dream Girl? I, I mean, but like seriously, when we were talking about I Have Nothing, I could see I Have Nothing being in Dream Girls. Yeah. Like, yeah. If, oh, yeah. if you compare it to... Um, and God, I'm telling forget. you, I'm not going. Thank you. Yeah. If you compare it in form and structure, it is quite similar. We've said this enough already, but like the non-Whitney songs are by some of the worst artists of that time that I can think of. Penny G. <laughs> Aaron Neville. Um, I, I, I mean... Early, like Neville Brothers, like from like the <laughs> 60s, yeah. you'll take. Aaron Neville from the 90s. <laughs> Lisa Stansfield is fine. I don't get excited about Lisa Stansfield. Um, I don't really like Joe Cocker. No, yeah. this is all very much catering to the soft rock FM yeah. listener. The album is definitely designed to listen to the first five 
tracks with Whitney right. on them and then to not flip it over. Because yeah. back in those days, we were probably all listening to it on cassette. You just rewind and go back to the beginning. Yeah. Like I said, they were like, well, we have half of a really amazing Whitney Houston album. Thanks for watching, everybody. Please give this video a like if you liked it. Please give it a pity like if you didn't like it. It won't hurt you. Subscribe to our channel. We put out reviews, rankings, reminiscences on all sorts of media, but especially music and video games. Two, this side is a link to another video that YouTube thinks you might like. So check that out up there in the corner. It's the button to our channel. Check us out. Also, I would recommend you check out our playlists because if you're only into the music content, you can just look at the music playlist and so on. Thanks, everybody. Maintain your groovy selves.